Well, greetings. Salutations. Greetings from Zion Baptist Church, where I just spent the last little bit. Um, our brothers and sisters over at Zion. Um, and I'm glad that you are here. You know, it is so great just to walk into uh, this place and hear the music going. You know, I, thank you, Greg. And... James and Alyssa and Craig and Nelda and Isaac. Did Isaac split already? Oh, there he is. Man. I'm looking for you, can't find you. Isaac, uh, we borrowed him from over from Highland, so make sure you, you tell him how much you enjoyed the drums back there. I, I enjoyed it as I walked in. Man. And now you got me. You may not want to clap quite yet. Um, I am going to go through this morning. We're, just so you know kind of what's going to happen here, we're going to go through a, a, a passage of Scripture that I really don't like. Um, so um, I'm okay with that as long as you are. So really what you're going to hear from me this morning is more of my own questioning about this passage and maybe ways that we could, we could look at it. And before we get there, I really have to make sure that you understand where it is that I'm coming from. So in you know really short time you know what Gary Mullen believes so Gary Mullen believes that God is the same yesterday as he is today as he will be tomorrow that there is no change in God now I do, that does not mean that I don't believe, believe that God is moved that he is that he is uh, passion is unknown to him I think he is moved he's moved by our prayers but he is he is at the he is the same yesterday today and tomorrow he is he is the same. He is, his core elements never change. So if, when people tell me that they think there's an Old Testament God and a New Testament God, I don't get that because I don't see that anywhere. I think God is and always has been. I think that God said something very significant in, in um, Genesis chapter 12 to Abraham when he told Abraham that he was going to bless Abraham so that Abraham could go and bless others. So you've probably heard that a number of times here. You know, we are blessed to be a blessing. That comes from, from Genesis chapter 12. It's really key for me. By the way, I think Jesus repeated that when he said, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. Basically the same thing. You are blessed to be a blessing. You are supposed to go out and make a difference. You're not supposed to hide yourself somewhere and, and just pretend you're supposed to actually do something. I believe that if you are maturing in Christ, you will become more like Christ, and that will be seen by the way you speak in tongues. Just kidding. <laughs> you can if you want, but for me, that's not the key. And, and, and again, you know, some of my friends would say, well, you know, that's got to be the key. For me, it's not. If you are maturing in Christ, then you will change in the way that you love. For me, that's key. You will love. And, you know, it's easy for me to say, yes, you know, I love Nelda. Isn't that sweet? We all love Nelda. Yeah, we all love Nelda. Gary we're having trouble with, but Nelda we love. Uh, you know, it, it, there are easy people among us. Hopefully our, our spouses are, are some of the easy people to love. But there are other easy people to love. Um, I won't tell you who they are. Um, I won't say that Heather's one of them. Uh, you know, that there are, there are, <laughs> so, you know, there are, uh, there are easy people to love, but there are also some maybe a little bit difficult people to love. Like Heather's father. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to be in deep trouble when I leave this place. Um, but as Christ matures in you, then you love people that you love better, but you love people that maybe have caused you problems in the past. That's kind of the maturing of you as a Christian. It's, it's part of what happens. You just love more and more. And so God continually brings people into my life that I need to learn to love because he wants me to become a better and better Christian. So I'm still in, we're in, we're in progress. None of us have got that. We are we are in process. We are getting to be more and more like Christ, but it is a process. So that's kind of my, my basic. That's where I'm coming from. Um, so I believe that holiness, if we talked about holiness, holiness is being perfected in love. It's what I believe it is. 
So that means just simply becoming better and better at loving people. So here's my problem. The parable we're about to read, well, yeah, it kind of falls apart on what I believe, which is why I struggle with it. It kind of ha gives us this story that, man, I just don't quite get. So what we're going to do this morning, and don't recommend you to do this, but what we're going to do this morning is I'm going to read a harmonized passage. I'm going to read you the parable, but I'm going to read you the parable as Matthew and Luke tell it. So in your notes, there is a, a passage, a scripture verse that's in there. And what it is, is that it, the dark writing in that is what Luke says. The light writing is what Matthew says. And I'm just going to read, read, read that through that way. And then we're going to discuss the parable. Uh, so it's be, it'll be a bit different this morning than from what it normally is. Before I get there, before I even get there, we have to talk about, we have to set it up. So we set it up by doing this. This parable follows hot on the heels of what we talked about last week. So last week we had this, you know, Jesus comes to the Pharisee's house and he, um, he sits down, at, well, he sits down and, and, and he sees this guy with abnormal swelling. Remember the guy with abnormal swelling? Not the normal swelling like I have, but the abnormal swelling. And so he has abnormal swelling and um, he says, can I heal him? Now, it's a Sabbath, and it's in the Pharisee's house. But the Pharisees say nothing. And so Jesus goes ahead and heals this guy with abnormal swelling. And after he heals them, they still say nothing. You know, so Jesus says, I guess I did okay. Actually, he knew they were pretty upset at him. And then he watched, because he was there for dinner, and he watched them take their seats. And so he told them this, this story, this parable. He said, you know what? When you're taking your seats, you shouldn't always go for the best seats, the most honorable seats. He said, in fact, you should take the low seats and then if you're supposed to be in a seat of more honor, the host will come in and he will move you up. And they kind of were quiet after that little story too. And then he went on. He said, hey, you know what? In fact, let's talk about who you invite over to your house. You should invite people over to your house that can invite you back. So you should go to the poor and, and the people that cannot invite you back. And you should invite them to your house. Because this is not about getting an invitation from them. This is simply about the way that you love. The way that you are humble. The way that you help community. And so after he gets there, in verse 15, beginning in your notes, um, this is Luke chapter 14, verse 15, when one of those at the table heard him, say, heard him this, heard him this, with when one of those at the table with him heard this, thank you, he said to Jesus, blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Let me translate that for you because I know you thought it was in English, but let me just translate that for you. What he's basically saying is, you know, Jesus, really not interested in taking the, the humble way, really not interested in inviting people over to my house that can't invite me back, really not interested in any of this stuff, but isn't it going to be good when we feast in heaven and we rule? Because we're the people of God. And all the rest of those suckers are going to be frying. Right? That's basically what he was saying. And so Jesus turns to this man and he decides to tell him a parable. Jesus replied, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain man, king, who was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and, fat, and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the banquet. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Must be like, kind of like a Maserati or something. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married so I can't come. That makes sense. Um, the rest seized his servants and mistreated them and killed them. The servant came back and reported this to his master. The king was enraged and he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then the owner of the house, the king, became angry and ordered... This is a really angry king. 
um, became angry and ordered his servants, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has been done and there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be filled. Full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. So the servants went out into the streets and they gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there that was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. The word of God for the people of God. You're supposed to say amen or blessed be to God or something like that. Um, here's my problem. I get to the end of that passage and I just don't really feel edified. I don't feel, oh yeah, that's great. Isn't it, it's a great part of the kingdom. It just doesn't hit me that way. Let me paraphrase the story for you. The kingdom of God is like a king who got the barbie on, got the steaks ready, and then sent the, you know, told the people that he invited that it, was, that it was time to come, and they decided not to. One went into a field, one went, into, uh, one went for his oxen or into his business, the other one, well, he just got married. No, no explanation needed. Uh, so they couldn't come. And so the king decides to send them a second time to be invited. He said, listen, the steaks are ready. The barbecue sauce is on. It is time to come and consume the meal. And still they wouldn't come. In fact, this time, instead of coming, they, they, they killed the servants. They were so offended by the dinner invitation that they just simply killed the servants. Um, those are people you never want to invite to dinner. Um, so then, so then he invited more people who came in. Now, they come in off the street. Remember, the barbie is ready. The steak is cooked. It is time, I mean, if, if, if the meal is ready, you've got to come now. And so they just came in off the street and they fill the house. And the king walks out and he sees one guy without wedding clothes on. Now, can I just remind you, all these people were in off the street and the dinner was ready. How many do you think were actually wearing wedding clothes? Probably none. So the king sees one person not wearing wedding clothes out of a hundred people not wearing wedding clothes. And he looks at him and says, why do you not wearing wedding clothes? Why? How, Greg, how did you get in here wearing a t-shirt and jeans? Do you see anybody else in this church wearing a t-shirt and jeans? I mean, anybody? <laughs> And so he ties him up and throws him, not doesn't just throw him out of the dinner, but he throws him out into the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And we're going, uh, I don't get it. And the traditional way of interpreting this is that the king was God, and the original people that were invited to the dinner were the Jews, and that Jesus sent, or that God sent his servants in the, in the form of his prophets to the Jews to invite them into the feast, but they refused to come. And eventually they, 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 they killed the, 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 the prophets, which all holds up so far, right? That's all stuff that actually happened. And so then um, the, the king sent his servants out to get the ones that are in the street. That would be non-Jews, like me. That would be us. So, you know, we said, well, we're just going to get everybody in here. And so we gather into the place. But the problem is, is that we also have the king, this, or God in the interpretation, going and sending out an army to kill those who would not come. Remember that the next time I invite you to supper at my place. <laughs> there may be an army coming to your door if you say no. And they won't be nice. But, you know, God says, you know what, I'm going to send out this army and I'm going to kill the ones that wouldn't come. And then I'm going to invite a bunch of people in that are just going to be invited in, but I'm going to pick on one of them. Just one of them. And I'm going to throw him out into darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so I get to the end of the interpretation in the story and say, really? It doesn't sound like a God that, I, that called me to bless to be a blessing. 
and a God that I think is trying to make us, or, you know, re, re order us so that we can love better. It just doesn't make sense. So I want to give you a bit of an alternate interpretation this morning. And really this morning, if I can just, let me say this, you are hearing Gary's thoughts. If you don't agree with them, great, we'll argue about it later. Um, but just this is kind of what I've come up with. The first thing I want to mention, and it's in your notes, is that the word used for the kingdom of God is like, that word like. Um, in every other, well not every, she can't say that. In a lot of other passages, that word is homoyas. It's homoyas. Actually, it's homoyas. Homoyas. And what that means is to resemble something. So like. It really translates very easily because it means to resemble something. But that's not the word that Matthew uses in his passage when he starts describing this scene. The word that he uses there is homoyao, which sounds pretty close, but it means to be made like. So you've got one that's to resemble and one that is to be made like. So if we go back to the beginning of this parable, Jesus comes and says, the kingdom of God has been made like. And the question we have is, okay, who made it to be like that? And remember, the context is, you've got a guy that's just said, but isn't it going to be great when we rule in heaven? Or isn't it going to be great when we feast at the banquet table of, of God? Isn't that going to be a great time? And it's almost like possibly Jesus was saying to him, you know what? I don't recognize what you have made the kingdom of God to look like. A few years ago, I had a, a phone call. A lot of you know about the phone call. We've laughed about it. You know, if, if you make phone calls to me that are really stupid, sometimes my friends and I will laugh about it. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> always be, be aware when you're phoning me. Um, I had a phone call from a lady. I don't know who, she, I don't, I don't, don't know who this lady was. She uh, was from a sister denomination. She did not attend our church. And she phoned up to talk to the pastor of, of the church. And so, of course, that came to me. And so we started talking, and um, she was upset at our music. And so she, we got this 20-minute, half-hour conversation where she's yelling at me for our music. And I, what I'm not getting is, you don't attend my church. Who cares? I mean, I know we're a little bit loud and boisterous, but are we so loud that you're hearing us in Fort Saskatchewan? Um, I, I don't think so. But she wanted to complain about our music. And so I was, you know, listening to her and, and, and she kept on complaining about this for a while. And she finished off her, her conversation with this, this beautiful moment we had together. She said, if there's going to be contemporary music in heaven, I don't want to go. <laughs> I'm going, really? Really? You know, being close to Jesus, um, streets of gold, mansion over the hilltop. It's the music that's going to keep you away from that? <laughs> you know, really? That's really what it is? But you see, her problem was that she had created, her, she had made the kingdom of God to be something that it wasn't. And so now she was, you know, she, if it didn't fit her little, what she wanted, then she just simply wanted to go, didn't want to go. I didn't have the heart to tell her I probably wasn't going to meet her there anyways, but just, just kidding. Uh, uh, but you know, sometimes we have this idea of what it is that the kingdom of God is like. And I think sometimes God just wants to say, listen, listen, settle. I need you to hear this. I need to hear you to hear this without preconception what this is like. So the kingdom of God has been made like, and the question is, who made it that way? And I have a feeling Jesus was talking to this guy that had this idea that the kingdom or that the bank, great banquet feast was something that he was going to rule at. One other thing I want you to notice, both Matthew and Luke agree, the first person to turn down the, 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 the invitation in both Matthew and Luke turned it down because he needed to get into the field. Now the field, again, this is just, this is just me, but the field has some very interesting elements about it. For instance, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a man who goes and sows seed in his field. 
He also said the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which is planted in the field. He also said the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field. He also said that the fields are white for harvest. Pray that the God, Lord of the harvest, will send his workers into the harvest field. When Jesus ascended, one of my favorite passages, Jesus ascended, all the disciples are there, well, 11 of them or whatever are there, and they're all looking up. Remember that passage in Acts? And they stand there looking up, and then all of a sudden these two angel dudes come up. And remember what, remember what, the, what the question was? The disciples are looking up. These guys said, why are you looking up? you got work to do. It's time to go into the field. I wonder, just maybe, if the guy that went into the field might not have been the good guy in this whole story because he was going to do what God had asked him to do. Okay, I said the parable doesn't quite fit with me for, for some reasons, and just hit those reasons. They're in your notes. But the first one is, is that for me, for what I believe, the kingdom of God is love. Number one, the kingdom of God is love. Now, I don't see a whole lot of love in the parable. The parable seems to be devoid of love. It's got, you know, come or else. It's got this kind of egocentric push-pull going through it. No, I'm not going to come. I'd rather go and be married. I'd rather go and see my oxen. You know, there's this, there's, you know, so therefore I'm going to kill you. A lot of love when he sent out the armies to, to kill them. Um, a lot of love when the servants finally came and, and killed whatever. Um, so th this seems to be absent of love. John, in John 3, we have the story of Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is this Pharisee, and he's trying to learn what's going on. And Jesus, you know, it's where Jesus says, you must be born again. And, and, and Nicodemus says, what do you mean born again? I can't become like a baby again. And Nicodemus says, no, no, you don't, you, you need to understand this. You need to be born of the Spirit. And then he goes on to talk about what it's like. And he says, you will be saved when you see the Son of God lifted up. In fact, just like Moses lifted up the, the snake in the desert, so when the Son of God is lifted up, if you look on him and believe on him, you will be saved. And then there's that classic verse, which probably a couple of you have memorized sometime in your life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved. God loves. God loves you. God loves me. God loves you so much that he was willing to send his Son to earth to die on a cross for you. Now, we can't say that he loves just you because really it's the world. If we take that, that, that verse in context, he's really talking about he loves everyone. He loves everyone that's here, but he loves everyone that's not here. God simply loves. And part of what the kingdom of God is, is, is love. So in John 21, when we come back to this, and I'm seeing, I'm sorry, my, I'm already got my shadow over there <laughs> but when we get to end of John 21 we have this 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 passage where Peter and the disciples are going fishing because that's what they do you know Jesus has come he's died he's resurrected they've seen him and now they're gonna go fishing because they're fishermen and they go out on the boat and they fish all night and they don't catch anything not the first time probably not the last time but you know they're out there and all of a sudden this dude shows up on the shore and he says hey cast your nets on the other side of the boat. And Simon Peter, being a very, very compassionate, knowledgeable man, said, like, what? What's that going to do? It's just the other side of the boat. But they do it to keep the guy happy. And the, nut, and then the nets fill with fish. And all of a sudden, Simon looks at the dude on the shore and says, Jesus. And he doesn't wait for, like, the boat's going way too slow. So he jumps in the water and swims for shore because he wants to get there as fast as he can. They have, this, they have this wonderful breakfast together. And then Jesus and Peter go for this walk. Remember what Jesus asked Peter on that walk? Simon, son of John, do you love me? We already know for God so loved the world, but Simon, do you, do you, love, do you love me? 
And if you've probably heard me preach a little bit, you know it's one of my favorite passages. And that the word there is akapao. Do you love me? Do you love me dearly? And Simon Peter replies, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Except he doesn't use ag agapao. He uses phileo. Which means, I sanction you. I approve you. I like you. So kind of the conversation goes like this. Simon said to John, Do you love me? And Simon goes, Yes, Lord, you know I like you. Guys, try that on your girlfriend. <sighs> they walk a little further. Simon, John, Jesus asked a question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Simon goes, yes, Lord. Do you know I like you? I approve of you. They walk a little further. And Jesus says, Simon, this time he changes the word. He says, do you approve of me? Do you like me? And the, and, and the response from Peter is that he got hurt. The kingdom of God is love. God loves us, but we are expected to love him. And in loving him, we love each other. It is what is expected in the kingdom of God. The second blank that you have there is that the, king of God, the kingdom of God is justice and mercy. And we get justice, sometimes we don't get mercy. Justice basically means you get what you deserve. Can I just go on record right now? Can I just, just right now, go on record saying, I do not want what I deserve. Because what I deserve isn't nice. But the kingdom of God is justice, but it is also mercy. So God comes and Jesus comes and says, listen, what I want from you is that you would extend mercy to those who are around you. Matthew 25, verse 35. Jesus speaking here. He says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer, Answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. There is a mercy that is supposed to be extended by those of us who make up the kingdom of God. And remember, the kingdom of God is here, but not yet. I know it's paradox. But there is something that is supposed to be given by us. We are supposed to be a people of mercy. We are supposed to be a people of grace because we have received mercy and we have received grace. And sometimes one of our biggest problems inside of the kingdom is that we forget that God showed mercy mercy on us and God showed grace on us God showed grace on me that last blank is that the kingdom of God is and you're not going to like this just, just so I can get that out really fast here the kingdom of God is sacrifice the kingdom of God is sacrifice. See, my problem is I didn't see these elements in the story. I didn't see love. I didn't see mercy. And I don't see sacrifice. The kingdom of God is sacrifice. Matthew chapter 19 tells a story of this rich young man who comes in and he asks he asked Jesus the question. He says, Jesus, what do I have to do to be saved? And Jesus' response is, you have, to, you, have to obey the, you have to obey the commandments. And so then the, the young man goes, gets a little bit you know, closer. He goes, okay, which commandments do I have to obey? And it's a little bit surprising here, to be honest with you. Because the response is, well, you have to obey 
and he lists the last six. Not the first four. Would have thought that, huh? Would have thought, obey the Lord your God. You know, keep the Sabbath day holy. Do not have any idols. You would have thought it would have been those. But instead, it was honor your father and your mother. Do not murder. Do not lie. Do not steal. Do not covet. And the young man said, oh, great. Because I've done that since I was like little. <laughs> and then Jesus throws a little bit of a curve as Jesus tends to do with us. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. I know Kevin was here and he spoke a little bit about being generous a few weeks ago. And that caused some of you some problems. And I get that. One of the responses I heard was, you know, and I don't know who I'm talking about, so forgive me. But, you know, does that mean I can't save up for rainy days? Does that mean I can't save up for retirement? Do I have to be generous to the point where I have nothing left for me? And let me tell you, the answer is no. The bigger problem is, is that, and again, generalization here, um, I, I know this isn't quite right, but none of you are. And we're going to be in trouble. But still, God has called us to be generous. To be generous with each other, with our lives. To be generous with what God has given us. He is the one who gave us everything. That does not mean that you don't take care of yourself, but it does mean that you recognize that when you do, well, is it something that you really need? And I've been very honest with you. I said, I've, I've done a lot of counseling with people uh, who are going to get married. And I am absolutely appalled at the number of people who come into my office to get married that have incredible debt. I married a couple, young couple, they don't attend here. They, were, I've, they came in to get married, we went through counseling, I married them and never saw them again. Don't know whether they're still together, but they had a real uphill road to hoe. Because when they came to see me to get married, they owed $120,000 on credit card debt. No car, no house. $120,000 on credit card debt. The average person, I'm told, spends about 10.6% of what they earn on servicing their debt. They give it to the credit cards. So you ask, why does the church not tithe? Actually, that's a wrong thing to ask because you are tithing. You're just tithing to CIBC. <laughs> Jesus says, live a life of sacrifice. That means money, yeah, but it also means, you know, with each other. This is the kingdom of God. Again, I don't see sacrifice in the story. We have made the kingdom of God to be something that I think it isn't. One of, the, one of my core beliefs is, is in the community. We are to be in community together. Community is hugely important. That's why this is hugely important. It would be so easy for me to get up on a day like today and for you to get up on a day like today and look outside and say, you know what? Today I think I'm just going to stay home. I've got my wife. My son's around once in a while. It's over here. That's all I need. But God has called us to community. He has called to be in a body that we can sacrifice for each other and we can love each other. And we can extend grace and mercy to each other. This is the kingdom of God. My question this morning is what 
kingdom is it that you're serving? What kingdom are you preparing for? Aesop told a story about a, a dog who was carrying a uh, piece of meat in his, in his mouth and he was running along a, a bank of a, of a lake. And he looked over at the lake and he saw this other dog, this reflection, and the dog was carrying a piece of meat. And the dog decided that he wanted that piece of meat too. So he dropped the piece of meat that he had into the water to try to get the piece of meat that the other dog had and lost both. And Aesop's moral to that is beware that you don't trade something of substance for something that is of shadow. That's the danger we have when we start thinking our own pre preconceived ideas of what it is that the kingdom of God is. We are participating daily in the kingdom of God. It is alive as we, as we extend mercy. It is alive as we love, as we sacrifice, as we come together in community. The kingdom of God is alive every time you take your knee and pray for somebody. And I don't want to lose that for something that is fake. Let me pray. Father, I get it, God. <laughs> it would be so much easier to follow a kingdom where I get what I want, where I do what I want, where I consider myself above others and I consider myself holy and I consider myself arrived. God, it would be easier in a, in a kingdom where maybe I could fool all of my friends. But that's not the kingdom you've called us to. It is harder, Lord, to live a life that says we will love those that are around us, even when we don't feel like loving. A kingdom that says we will extend mercy and we will extend grace because mercy and grace has been extended to us. And that we will be a people of sacrifice for those that are around us. But God, something tells me that the substance of the kingdom is in those things. So God, help us to hold on to what is maybe harder. Help me to understand what it is that you have called me to do. And may I do it in this community with my friends. I pray your blessing on each one of them too, that they would hear your voice clearly and be able to go out and do what it is that you have called them to do. Let us participate, God, in the kingdom together. We pray this in the name of Jesus. All God's people said, Amen. Amen.